Welcome to Deconstructive Criticism. My name is Aaron Flam. This episode's guest is, in a way, two people in one person. Titania McGrath is a Twitter personality who describes herself as activist, healer, radical, intersectionalist poet, selfless and brave. Which is selling herself short, I might add. Titania is a fearless feminist fury against the patriarchy, whiteness, climate change, facts, and comedy. One can but stand in awe of her self-righteous righteousness and wonder how does one become so heroic as she is. Luckily, Titania McGrath has just released a book called Boak, which instructs the reader on how and what to think, or in most cases not think, in order to avoid being a racist, misogynistic, capitalist asshole. Titania explains chapter by chapter how you can become a righteous warrior for justice without ever having to actually do anything but think the right way and demonstrate it by posting on social media. It's not the same as doing nothing at all. It is something, and sometimes require poetry. Titania protests so much that one might suspect that she is satire. I have been following Titania since Twitter blocked the account of Godwin Elfwick, another account so thoroughly PC it was deemed satire and had to be blocked. Titania has since filled the void, and now she has even released a book. It is a riveting and very poignant read, and today we will talk with Titania's creator, comedian and writer Andrew Doyle, about the book he has written as his character, Titania McGrath. The conversation between me and Andrew took place over Skype, so for you who want to see us, there is video of the conversation after this short introduction in only sound. But before introducing Andrew, I want to thank you for contributing to Deconstructive Criticism, or in Swedish, Dekonstruktiv Kritik. Thank you for being a Patreon, donating via PayPal, Bitcoin or Swish, 0768 943737, 0768 943737, or in English, 0768943737. I am grateful for your support and it will be more needed than ever in the coming days, weeks, months and years. If you want something more material for your money, please visit my website www.aronflam.com slash merchandise where you will find fantastically stylish t-shirts, cups and hoodies with the text Your feelings are hurting my thoughts. This is all available at www.aronflam.com slash merchandise. And before I introduce Andrew, I also want to say a very, very special thanks aimed at you who bought my book, The Här är en svensk tiger, in English. English, this is a Swedish tiger. However, it does not exist in English yet, but I'm working on finding a translator and hopefully I can get it done by Christmas. But that all hinges on selling enough copies of the Swedish original, and by now, you that ordered a copy should have it in your hand. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to write this book. It has been one of the most grueling experiences of my life, and by far the most rewarding. This is a Swedish tiger traces the trouble Sweden is in today to what it did during the Second World War via Olof Palme's meeting with Yasser Arafat in Algiers in 1974 and back to the present and the fall of the greatest social democracy the world has ever seen, Sweden. If you haven't yet ordered a copy, you can still do that at www.aronflam.com slash merchandise. Now... Andrew Doyle is a writer and comedian. He is the co-writer of Jonathan Pye, the spoof news reporter created by Tom Walker that has become a YouTube sensation with some clips exceeding well over 100 million views. As a stand-up comedian, Andrew Doyle has appeared at Edinburgh Fringe Festival, he has written plays for BBC's Radio 4 and so much more it would frankly take too long to go through it all. To sum up, Andrew is an expert comedian and an expert on comedy and satire. Among other things he has done is an adaptation of Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, and he's currently working on an adaptation of Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, satire in other words. He is also regularly appearing on Sky News as a commenter on politics and current affairs, and is a regular columnist for Spiked Online magazine. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Doyle, enjoy. Welcome to Deconstructive Criticism, uh, Mr. <laughs> Andrew Richard Doyle. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I have some pointed questions I'd like to ask you, but before we start, I'd like to start with a very broad question. Who okay. are you? Who am I? Uh, yes. I'm a comedian and writer and satirist, uh, and I um, 
I've, I suppose I've worked in comedy for stand-up comedy for about 15 years, something like that. And um, lately I've been more focused on writing satirical things, political satire, because it sort of dovetails quite well with the uh, political articles that I write, you know, sort of um, for Spiked magazine, which yeah. is a... So I don't know if I don't know if everyone knows it. It's a sort of kind of it comes from a Marxist tradition, but is a, a kind of left leaning, humanistic, pro free speech uh, magazine. But it also has a very kind of well, what some people would describe as a libertarian streak, insofar as it it, it values uh, individual autonomy over state intervention. So that would be where I'm coming from. Are you yourself a Marxist? Uh, no. To begin with, no. To begin with, no. No, I don't think so. No, I, no. I think. No. I um I th I think those days are gone, haven't they? I think that argument's been been lost. <laughs> so well, I, don't, I mean, when you were young and starting start university. university. No, I'd say I was a socialist. That was the way I saw myself, um, and, and I suppose I probably, broadly speaking, still am. All right, because, all right, because uh, I see here that you have a doctorate in early Renaissance poetry. Yes, yes. I do. So your Which father I... must be very proud of you. <laughs> It's what they always wanted. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's what they pushed me into doing uh, and I ended up doing it. Yeah, uh, I do. And of course, there's no, that, you know, that isn't really a political <laughs> endeavor. Although that said, even back then, I think the academy was was um, was very politicized. Yeah, so, well, you know, I, I believe you. But I, I, I was just thinking there must be some easier way to tell your father you're gay than writing an entire doctoral thesis in re early Renaissance poetry. Yeah, but there isn't a, a more creative way of telling him. You know, Maybe you not. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I meant to be offensive there. So, Good. just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, so you started out in Renaissance poetry, mm -hmm. and that was your interest when you were younger. Yes. How come? Um, can well, I, I mean, I, not really. I mean, I, I think it sort of happened by accident, because when I, when I started doing my English degree, my undergraduate degree, I had a tutor there who was very... Uh, interested in, in renaissance poetry and as a result i became interested in it you know because it's one of the it was one of those people who who inspired you to, so i i became interested in that subject i tended to fare better academically speaking in work in in essays relating to that era that period so i i ended up writing that and then i ended up doing a master's in renaissance poetry uh and then the doctorate so yeah it's sort of i i also went where the the scholarships took me. I mean, I, I, I did the master's because I got a scholarship to go to York and then I did the doctorate because I got funded to do it. And so I kind of just slipped into working on the things that I most enjoyed. That's how it sort of happened. It wasn't as though I always used to read Marlowe and Shakespeare and that and what just desperately wanted to do it. In fact, at school, I'd go so far as to say I didn't really like Shakespeare at all. I know almost nothing about early Renaissance poetry, but I want to say the, word, the name Petrarch. Petrarch, yeah, but that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. He wrote love sonnets to, to a dead woman, Laura. Um, and, right. and Petrarch's quite important as a, as a, as an influence on the on the English sonneteers, people like Philip Sidney, um, and Wyatt, Thomas Wyatt. You, so the, the 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 Italian Petrarchan tradition of love sonnets sort of became quite fashionable over here. By the time Shakespeare wrote his sonnets, actually, they were becoming quite unfashionable. Because uh, they, they weren't actually always about love. Everybody wrote them for a v myriad of reasons, right? right? It was like uh, a popular love song today. Yeah, and, and, and most crucially, they're about unrequited love, you know, I mean, on, on the whole. I mean, if you look at the most obvious example of a Petrarchan sonnet sequence from the English perspective is Sir Philip Sidney's Astrophil and Stella, which is all about someone he cannot have. Someone who, who and, you know, in the case of Petrarch, he was... Uh, she dies halfway through the sequence, so oh, lovely. She, so, so he cannot have a corpse, right? So, oh, but that, but but, it, but this is what everyone, all the, these people knew, all these writers knew, is that the pain and the anguish of love is when it's unrequited. There's nothing really uh, tragic or fascinating about requited love. It gets a bit boring once it's requited. People sort of go off it, don't they? Yes, you have to divide up what, uh, who's supposed to do what around the house and all that. So yeah, it, it, th and that sort of stuff doesn't lend itself to to great romantic epic writing. No. On Wednesdays, that. I do laundry. You do yeah. dishes. Yeah, I, I mean, think there's a way to do it. That would be quite a challenge, but it's not. It's not something I would dare attempt. So how did you get into comedy? 
I was doing my doctorate at Oxford and I started doing stand-up on the open mic circuit. And that meant just getting a, a late bus up and down uh, all, all the time because where you do stand-up, basically. You know, I, there are places that elsewhere in the UK where you can, of course. But in terms of the open mic circuit, you need somewhere with where there's plenty of venues and London is the place. So I ended up just doing that and... And yeah, then I was how a teacher. Come? What got you interested in comedy? Well, I would I'd always written comedic scripts and sketches and things, and I'd done that from from being an undergraduate, even before I used to do that at school, actually. And then I did a sketch show in London. It must have been while I was still at yes, it was while I was still at Oxford, and there was a space in the running order. We we were basically ten minutes short of the running time, and we didn't have time to rehearse and write a new sketch. So I just wrote a monologue which was a stand-up piece effectively so it, it happened by accident in that sense and then I realized how much I enjoyed doing it even though it didn't go particularly well but I still liked it I still I so I and ended up just doing it and then it became a necessity you know that's where I was earning money so um but now I tend to 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 focus less on I mean I, I you know I just did a stand-up show at the Edinburgh Fringe I'm still doing it it's just I'm I'm focusing more on on writing and I particularly like writing for characters and other people you know so yeah I don't know. because uh, part of what you're most famous for I guess is uh, you're a part of a writing duo who makes this uh, well for us Swedes it's a YouTube character uh, Jonathan Pye yes um, I, I don't write for him anymore I, I've, I we wrote together for three years so I started writing for him December 2015 and ju- finished this January. Uh, so we had, you know, we did a, a few years collaboration. Um, and now I'm moving into, I've got this other character who I'm I'm working a lot on, Titania McGrath. So uh, yeah, that, but yes, people will know that YouTube character. Yeah, we'll get to Titania. Um, uh, I promise you, my friend. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but first, because there is something here that's interesting to me is the dichotomy between... Uh, romance and uh, cynicism which yeah. i guess uh, the romantic part being your interest in early renaissance poetry and yeah. cynicism being an integral part of comedy as i see it yeah but i don't consider myself particularly cynical uh in an odd way and i don't i don't know if satire is particularly cynical i think comedy is cynical but i think i think satire is more optimistic than that i think sat- satire is urging a change trying to change something for the good and and it's based uh, on the presupposition that things can change for the good, whereas I don't think comedy does. Comedy is is a more a resignation to how terrible things are, and our our only recourse is to laugh at it. So I think that's the sort of a difference. Yeah. Well, when I first met you, I didn't know you were Titania McGrath, which is okay. one of my favorite characters to follow on Twitter, uh, oh. at least since Godfrey Elfric died or mm. was blocked was murdered. Yes. Uh, so uh, you are, in effect, Titania McGrath. Uh, who is she? She is a radical, intersectional feminist, fourth wave feminist, not a proper feminist, uh, a, um, a permanent offence seeker, someone who's desperate to be, um, ad- she wants to, she wants everyone to perceive her as the victim. She believes that anyone who is female is a victim anyway, because we live in a, an oppressive patriarchy. She's completely uh, unaware of her own privilege and but spends a lot of the time castigating others for their supposed privilege on the basis of their skin color usually or their gender um, and does not see the essential hypocrisy of that uh, she is a satirical representation of the people who consider themselves to be left-wing and progressive but are neither uh, there is nothing left-wing about going to a private school uh, being independently wealthy and uh, lambasting and attacking working class people because of their skin color. There's nothing left wing, remotely left wing about that. Uh, There's nothing from my perspective, uh, authentically left wing about denying the importance of the individual or or seeking censorship at every turn. Um, That is not to say that left wing uh, governments have not supported censorship or censorial practices. But I don't for me that that doesn't work as a as a as a left wing premise. But that's who she is. So she is a uh, she embodies that kind of victim culture that we see coming from predominantly bourgeois people who are the least well-placed to claim victimhood. And as her, you have written a a self-help book, or what is it exactly? 
Yeah, uh, it's called Woke. It's a guide. It's called Woke, a guide to social justice. And it is uh, it is effectively I mean, I've read a lot of the books by the sort of fourth wave feminist activist, intersectional activists. And what they have in common, they do. They are obviously they have their differences. But what they all have in common is an incredible narcissism. It, they can't hide it. So each page just bleeds this kind of egotistical, look at me, look at my situation. Why won't the world change to suit my uh, views and my my preferences? And that's what it's really, and that's what t- Titania is. Titania is, uh, she is a um, narcissist, basically. Well, I, I enjoyed the read thoroughly, I must say. Uh, I, I, I find, uh, because uh, I, I, I like the first chapter. It's uh, in English, My Struggle. Uh, we mm. would say uh, Kampf. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, in uh, the more Germanic tongue. And, yeah. um, and uh, what do you think has shaped her into this person? Um, it's a good question. I saw a... Um, a debate about about this notion of of what is stirring up this victimhood culture um and a very young person tried to basically uh t- lock horns with camille palia the american academic about this and what palia said was well you haven't experienced any hardship you know her generation come from the, are from the generation who remember growing up with people who fought in the war you know people who've actually experienced something um that and and of course you don't have that now i think i think a lot of the people who are desperate or who mark themselves out, out as social justice activists and who see the world as, as this sort of fascistic um awful uh place they they just haven't experienced hardship they just don't know what it know what it is hence you get um uh, post traumatic stress disorder diagnosis when someone calls you a nasty name on twitter these people haven't been in nam you know they don't know what this the stuff actually means um how it's happened i don't know um but I, it's a question i'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on or anyone's thoughts on because i don't know quite there's something i'm trying to grapple with i think it's probably the fault of my generation i think it's probably and what generation is that when were you born I was born in 1978, so I'm generation. I'm the end of Generation X. Same here. Just, just before the millennial generation begins, and um, as people forget this about the millennials, is they're getting old, and uh, then they're not the, the you know Generation Z who are following them. Uh, the statistics seem to show that they've got no truck with this kind of sensorial nonsense. Anyway, that's an, that's another point. Um, but I think it's our generation's fault. There's a really good chapter in Claire Fox's book. She wrote a book called "I Find That Offensive." And she's talking about teaching and she's talking about um, the kind of overly uh, molly coddling quality of of teaching practices from my generation. Um, insofar as they would encourage. I mean, I was a teacher, so I know this. They would encourage people to have any sense of grievance, any sense of, of if they're upset about anything, however small, it will be treated as though it's with, with incredible significance, as though this really matters. Well, of course, a lot. And that's not to say that if someone is if someone's being bullied or if something like that is happening, of course, it should be addressed. Of course, it should. And it's not right. But when a, a child comes to you with saying, oh, someone someone said something a, a little bit mean, you know, at some point, the teachers have to be able to say you're going to have to get over that. That's that is life. Um, and that isn't to suggest I'm not sensitive to people who are being bullied. It's the opposite. I, I think I think bullying is disgusting. It's one of the things I hate the most. And schools in particular have a responsibility to to clamp down on that. But by the same token, um, but people... But this is a are, pedagogy, as you put it, that actually yeah. fosters bullies. Because that's yes, what the social justice wor- warriors turn into. That's exactly right. What what the social justice activist movement is, is a, is a way... Well, it, what it does do is it legitimizes bullying, effectively. That's what it is. So, yes, it does create that. I'm suggesting that when a pupil gets a low mark, and is crying and screaming about it, you have to tell them, well, you need to work harder and get better. Not, I, We're not going to pander to your emotion when it comes to this, because actually this is for your own good. I think that in order to be an autonomous adult, you need to be effectively socialized as a child. In that respect, I suppose I have quite a conservative view of education, but it, but it works and it's true. Um, so I think it is our fault largely. And, and you have and I also think that the millennial generation have been unfairly demonized. I think I think it is a minority of, of, of you know, I, I think there is a problem with resilience, but that's not their fault. That's our fault. We created that. Um, 
uh, but a lot of a lot of young people are just as sick of the, the sensorial nature of a social justice activism as anyone else and you they they get branded in this way and people complain about millennials all the time but virtually all of the millennials that i've spoken to about this subject are just as sick of it as everyone else it's it's a shame really uh, but yeah the the I think what you said about the legit, the bullying is absolutely right. I mean, you'll notice on Twitter, for instance, on social media, the people who put pronouns in their bio, the people who have the um, pro EU hashtag in their bio, the people who have the gay rainbow flag in their bio tend to be the most intolerant people of all. And yet those signifiers, those things are meant to convey an idea of tolerance. What the, the, You put your pronouns in your bio to say, I'm a tolerant person. I'm one of the good guys. I'm, 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 I'm progressive. And the reality is, that nine times out of ten, you see those, you know they're going to come out with something venomous and vicious and 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 bullying, and and that's one of the one of the odd ironies of the whole thing. Well, yeah, I personally think it has to do uh, a teeny tiny bit with socialism, because I think okay. socialism is a collectivist ideology and a collectivist egalitarian ideology that wants to sort of smooth out all the rough edges between people and create this gray, just uh, formless mass of people. I think that is a form of socialism that I do not subscribe to, but I think you're right that it does exist. Well, I, I live in a country that is uh, marked by it, to say the least. Yes. Uh, I mean, first I th time we met wasn't that uh, pleasurable for you. I didn't make the best of impressions, I suppose. I thought you did. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed it. I you screamed at now. an audience for 15 you screamed at an audience. That was the most. That was the most exciting and entertaining aspect of that entire debate. <laughs> so I was more than happy with that. I like drama, you know. Well, thank you. I provided some. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of socialism, um, I, I see it more as a, a, a corrective to the excesses of capitalism, not a uh, not the antithesis of capitalism. I see it in, insofar as, you know, you can say that under under a total free market system where you can end up with a situation where people are earning billions and billions and billions of pounds that they don't need. And what's what a what a true form of socialism is, it is it just curbs that it just introduces a set not to suggest that people don't have ambition that they can't earn more and that there shouldn't be differentiation in 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 economic interests but that you end up with a situation where the, the most egregious examples are rectified that's for me what it means yeah okay i understand that but for me that's just redistribution of wealth and that doesn't yeah. have necessarily to be socialist to me it's a, it's a fundamental premise of socialism uh, yes, I would say it is, but I'm saying that other economic and political systems can also have re redistribution of wealth and do they, have redistribution of wealth. They all tax people. But I think you can also have, there is room for a, a socialist template that has individuality at its core. And that can come from a Marxist tradition. Uh, if you if you consider the, the, the entire view of emancipating the, the proletariat, is because all they have is their labor. That, that is the only thing that they can they can choose to sell or not, choose to withhold. That is an individual choice, and that's something that that, that can be at the heart. And let's not forget, I mean, the, 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 I've mentioned this before, but I think one of the most elegant expressions of this idea is from Oscar Wilde, oddly enough, who wrote an article called The Soul of Man Under Socialism. And really what that article is, what that essay is, is a defense of individuality. What he is saying is um, that we need to uh, work collectively and we need to um, empower, well, how does he put it? We need a form of slavery through technology, in other words. He's saying that we need, we need the robots to do our work for us so that we have leisure time, so that the, there, there can be no individuality without leisure time, without the time to read, to think. And what he's saying is actually that socialism is a means to achieve that. So I think there is a, there is a tradition where socialism doesn't mean collectivism as such. What it means is collective action to, for the benefit of the individual. I um, don't really agree with you, although I have uh, been observing you, Brits, uh, my entire life, and I know yeah. you don't take anything so seriously as to actually enact a revolution, a communist one at least. To do that, no um, way. But here it would be a different matter, I think. But I am glad you brought up Oscar Wilde, because uh, to tie back to Titania's uh, book, Woke, A Guide yes. to Social Justice, uh, she writes, uh, 
This is sort of in connection to Oscar Wilde. Joking about pedophilia is even worse than actual pedophilia. Yeah. Because he was, uh, I, I believe, uh, condemned for buggery. He was. Um, in fact, there was a movement. There's a plaque, a blue plaque. In, in England, there's lots of these um, commemorative plaques to famous authors on various houses that they used to live in. There was a blue plaque in a place called Worthing in, in Sussex. And there was a campaign to have it removed on the grounds that he had sex with people who were below the age of consent. Um, firstly, that is spurious. We, we, we don't know that that's even true. Um, but on the other hand as well, there was no age of consent for gay people at this time anyway. So, I mean, it's a completely uh, ludicrous argument. Um, so, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> no, I, I, was just, I was just remarking on how true uh, it is when uh, Titania writes, joking about pedophilia is even worse than actual pedophilia. Because as she uh, points out, it, uh, you know, it, uh, it reaches more people than just the one crime. It's Yeah, she's saying that it, because it can be retweeted. I mean, it's based on the idea that words are violence. She believes that words are a form of violence. And hearing about bad things, she thinks, is just as bad as experiencing those things, um, which is a, a real problem with the social justice movement. They cannot, they cannot divorce the idea of, of, of words and arguments. To, than, to, they can't divorce that from actual physical harm. Yes, I, I, uh, they can't uh, see... But you can tell the difference between you and Titania, right? Yeah. But of course. Titania cannot tell the difference between you and Titania. Well, I mean, she would hate me, wouldn't she? Well, you are a middle-aged, uh, privileged man. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm white. You forget the most important thing. She, oh, she yes. doesn't. She doesn't like white people. She certainly doesn't like male people. No, uh, but so she, she says she, in think... her book that you've written that she's not white except for the color of her skin. Yeah, she doesn't consider herself white at all. She considers whiteness as a, uh, a, a philosophical um, st standpoint, not as a, as a descriptor. And she's yes. not alone in that. That's really common among, in, in, uh, in the humanities in, in universities as well. Whiteness is the problem, not white people. Yeah, so when you say you're white, you're just actually self-identifying as white. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So, you I mean, don't have uh, to be white, you're just refusing to give up your whiteness. Exactly. It's utterly ludicrous, isn't it? And this is this is another example of how how uh, deranged um, and how the, the, the gulf that exists between the humanities and academics and the real world. The gulf is absolutely huge. It's you know, they've spent years creating their own little esoteric language, uh, buying into all this Foucauldian nonsense this post-structuralist nonsense that was never true to begin with. But if it's like any other religion, if a number, if enough people repeat the holy texts and quote each other repeating the holy texts, then it becomes truth. Even though they don't believe in truth, do they? They call it uh, a logocentrism. That there's no inherent truth. Precisely. But whatever, you know, but, but, it, but it is the whole Derrida thing, the whole thing, you know, it's, it's built on a foundation of sand. It's not real, but, but it's just, it's just gained this illusion of credibility through decades of, reproduction and, and re repetition well you call it a tyr or titania calls it a tyranny of facts i believe yeah the tyranny of facts exactly so you know when, you, when you're faced with biological realities for instance when you're faced with the fact that identity politics um involves uh, a, a repudiation of of reality then what her her strategy then is to just deny reality because well, it's in to her theory yes uh, there are some uh things that I think explain her quite well that you've written for her. Yeah. Um, um, one trauma is that her mother breastfed her even though she was a vegan. Horrible, yeah. I mean, can you imagine? N no, I cannot. Uh, I no. was a meat eater from the start, so... Oh, for you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Fine. Omnivore, actually. So, Omni uh, yes. Okay. Um, and then um, uh, she thinks that... Uh, we will reach uh, utopia when women are valued more than men, then and only then will we have achieved true equality. Yes. Because she doesn't really believe in equality. She doesn't really know what it means. She's, I mean, she, she's, well, insofar as she thinks that in order to redress the power structures in society, you need to invert the power structures of society, not just find a, um, a sort of balance. Yeah, and that's where you get this cult-like thing, because yeah. they're actually just mirroring the Nazis. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And it's, it's um, yeah, it is essentially social engineering. 
that's what they want to do. Yes. Um, and it's based on an illusory premise. It's based on something that doesn't exist. You know, you have this situation where they believe in these power structures that privilege white males, and they think they can redress that. For instance, when when Birmingham University had older white male academics being mentored by young black female academics because of their unconscious bias. Um, well, th th that's a faith-based position. You know, we don't know that that unconscious bias even exists, let alone that we can quantify it, let alone that it can be redressed by the presence of a young black woman. I mean, this is this is the stuff of cults. It isn't real. Um, and what what annoys me about it isn't so much that it's hap that that people are suggesting it. It's the capitulation of authorities to it. You know, the, the what should be happening in this situation is the universities should be saying, OK, we take on board your recommendation. We're going to dismiss it because it's nonsense. But thanks for thanks for suggesting it. Like in uh, in Oxford University, when um, campaigners, a group of very posh young students were said they were upset by the statue of Cecil Rhodes, the colonialist on Oriel College, and they wanted the statue removed. These are very, very posh kids, very, very, very privileged kids. But they said that they felt like they were being punched. It felt like the equivalent of being punched every time they saw that statue because they they clearly they're historically illiterate and they don't understand that uh, a man of his kind living at that time, it would have been weird if he wasn't colonialist or didn't have colonialist values. But what happened in that case is that the vice chancellor of Oxford said, no, we're, the statue stays where it is. But we're what not is it that the, they're upset about? Is it that their ancestors committed what they considered to be crimes or... Is it the no, constant it was, reminder of their cultural heritage or? No, no, no. This was, this was largely coming from black students who, uh, but, but rich black students who, who felt that because Cecil Rhodes would have seen them as inferior, I'm sure that's probably right. He would have seen them as inferior, um, but he lived over a hundred years ago, you know? Yeah. Um, so um, that the statue in of itself is an endorsement of that racist viewpoint, which of course it isn't. Um, it's, you know, we live in a country that has a history and recognition of that history is actually rather important. Um, particularly it's when it comes extremely important, I'll tell yeah. you, because I grew up in this country where we sort of, uh, um, sweep the, the bad parts of history under the rug. Yeah. Right. If you've ever wondered why Sweden seems so squeaky clean, that's why we're very good at it. It's a mistake though. It means you don't, it means you don't confront uh y your past and you don't learn from history and and you can't just go for a sort of year zero approach and say well we'll, we'll wipe out all the mistakes that ever happened in the past uh, because then you're doomed to repeat them and um, uh I, it's such a mistake i i it's this, this need to sanitize history you know which is straight out of orwell and it's weird to me that i mean people get very upset when you mention the orwell comparison because it's because it's become predictable yeah um it's become a cliche but there is no other way to describe it. I'm, rem I'm reminded of when Christopher Hitchens went to the, uh, I think it was North Korea, and he was talking about, I, I, I was determined not to make the comparison with Orwell. I was determined not to do it. But then as soon as he was there, something happened where the police arrested him and wanted to know what he was thinking or what he was right. And he said, but they make you do it. They force you to make the comparison. There is no other comparison to make. Well, well not maybe North Korea, but here you can definitely throw in Brave New World. Yeah. Oh, yeah. there's others. Kafka. Absolutely. Oh, you know, there's there's been plenty of dystopian uh, novels. Um, but yeah, I think. But Sweden is, uh, you know, it's a futuristic utopia from the past, basically. Okay. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, claim to have a broad knowledge of Sweden or its culture. Uh, no, I'm ju I'm just saying because well, I find it interesting because I've studied this culture as well as I can, which is yeah. not much because we don't have much history. Yeah. Uh, and I've tried to uh, sp and and your history is quite easy to study because you have a long one and you've uh, written most of it down. Well, not yeah. in an unbiased way maybe, but you know, still you you have yeah. it there. And yeah. uh, for instance, uh, when you say, I, I don't know where it started, I, I, I start thinking about, uh, well, one of uh, the social democracy of Sweden's founding fathers was Per Albin Hansson. He became prime minister in 1932. Mm -hmm. And in 1945, I think, just after the end of the Second World War, he declared uh, world socialism revived. Uh, by and possibly in cooperation with uh, the Labour Party in Britain, right? And they restarted the Socialist International, which okay. 
uh, then became a, a socialist uh, international organization uh, to rebuild the, you know, the failing democracies of Europe, uh, mm -hmm. uh, connecting the labor parties. And that started you know, the age of social democracy, which I think we're seeing the end of now. The, okay. the, the welfare state. And, and that doesn't really have anything to do with my political leanings. It's just, uh, I'm looking at technology and how it's changing our societies. And I don't think if we're going to have welfare states going forward, I don't think they can look like they have up until this point. So what are, you, what are your political leanings then? What, how would you describe yourself? Well, I, I discovered myself as a sort of libertarian quite young. Uh, okay. Oh. Which is uh, easy to do if you're uh, if you have those uh, uh, leanings and are brought up in the social democracy of Sweden. You sort of uh, yeah. uh, you start uh, well uh, banging your head head against the system quite young, and then but yeah. at heart philosophically, I'm a cynicist basically of okay. uh, the yes. Diogenes kind. That is something I I did pick up on when we met before. <laughs> Uh, yes. To be honest, but I, I yeah, I mean, yeah, but I do I appreciate remember. individualism and freedom of speech and freedom. I think above all things, yes. as that's what. Yeah, I mean, what what was the what was the debate we were having? I can't remember what the topic was. It was, was this... about parody and freedom of speech. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right. Um, yes, and 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 yeah, and I think what is what? Yes, I remember now. And you did you did shout at the audience. I think your point was that they were. That you that you were not free really to because because the audience lacked the ability to understand. Satire. Well, you come from England. You have freedom of speech, and you have an exception for parody, right? We have the parody laws. Yeah, I go so far as to say we have freedom of speech. We we do have freedom of speech on the whole, but we do also have a, a lot of we have hate speech laws. Yes, which means we don't really have full freedom of speech. We we you know. Now, over 3,000 people a year are arrested in this country for things they've said online, which means that we don't have freedom of speech, really. Um, but we, we, have a, we have it a lot better than most people. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. I, I think you do. And I mean, nothing's perfect ever. But yeah. uh, I mean, Sweden got freedom of speech when we came into the EU in basically the early 90s. So in 94, we got freedom of speech. Before that, we had freedom of the press. But it was really just a way for... Uh, the state to uh, maintain an information monopoly, you had to sign yeah. your name and, you know, uh, so, and, and we don't have the negative freedom of speech. It's, it's not even though state censorship, although state censorship is obviously appalling and tyrannical, uh, that's not the problem we're facing at the moment. We're, the problem we're facing is, is self-censorship, is, and, and particularly from comedians and satirists and, and people in the arts who are effectively um, policing what they do, how they express themselves because we live in a culture where if you express the wrong idea, you will be cancelled. Yes. Cancel culture. That's what we call it. So, so I understand that the inevitable outcome of that, and I do, I do sympathize with it is that, you know, we all have to make a living uh, and you're not going to make a joke if you feel that it will destroy your livelihood. That, that does make sense, but this is absolute anathema to the artist. Yes. Uh, and also if you, uh... If you want to do art and you can't support yourself expressing yourself freely, then you're not really doing art. So if you're a comedian right. uh, who just plays along with this, you're not yeah. really a comedian. You're a propagandist. Sure. I, I mean, I think art can be educational, but it doesn't have to be. Certainly, I, I, I think most good art isn't. Um, most the, the, the art that I love the most has absolutely nothing to do with morality. And, and I don't think it should. Um, but so that is may not... I ask, who are your comedic references? Okay, specifically comedically, um, yeah. it would be um, things like Ambrose Bierce, um, uh, Stand Up Wise Victoria Wood. Um, uh, who else? Um, Chris Morris, uh, Amanda Inucci from the who wrote the thick of it. Um, I think Chris Morris's Brass Eyes hasn't been surpassed really when it comes to the satirical uh, in terms of it i don't know if that got to sweden was a satirical Not really no it's a satirical television show uh, do you know i think it's early mid 90s early 90s that sort of time uh but i could be wrong that but i think it's around then um it's worth watching 
it's 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 fantastic but um and it's it it is characterized by that fearlessness yes that well we had a version of it called the the parliament it's like a it's like a sh- panel show right yeah yeah and i actually wrote for that show in sweden okay but unfortunately uh, well you know comedy works only if people understand the references yeah, yeah. Yes. And if you have a population that has been lied to most of their lives, then it's kind of impossible to make some jokes. For yeah, instance, is... I started yelling at the audience because they believe that we live in a liberal Western democracy, and we don't. We live in a social democracy. So, right. you know, it's the discussion becomes completely insane. And then you start yeah. talking about you have an exception for parody. We sort of have an exception for parody via the EU laws, but not really in Swedish law. So, the parody law is just to stop you from getting sued yeah. if you if you mock someone or use their material online. But it's it's it hasn't really been tested. To be fair, all right, uh, it's, it's a relatively new law. Um, so I don't know how how how. I mean, but we we still have comedians who are falling foul of the law. I mean, Joe Brand was investigated by the police for a joke, for instance. That only happened a few weeks ago, um, and so therefore. We, you know, we we don't have a situation where we have, as comedians, complete freedom to say what we want to say. I think what you're saying about the um, the the parliament is it called the, that that sort of satire can only work if you have a culture that is not infantilized. Yes, you know, the, the, I think I think that is a that is a problem. Is that ultimately when people are not granted the freedom to think for themselves. Um, then you end up with a situation where they're not able to appreciate things like art and satire and and the arts and satire actually lose their meaning then you know because people don't recognize them for what they are i think it's very depressing yes uh, i agree and that is why i now most of the time do podcasts where i talk about uh, taboo subjects without actually making too many jokes except for you know the offensive jokes about your renaissance doctorate uh, well, earlier in the conversation more. that's more offensive than it because that's directed very personally yes yes yeah i know i know i i did my research <laughs> yeah i did, I did. <laughs> so um um and uh, you you start every uh, chapter in the book uh, or rather titania starts every chapter in the book uh, with a quote yes and i was wondering are the quotes real or not yes all of them except for one which one so all of uh, the St. Francis of Assisi quote. He, he never said, wanted to fuck a bush. That's it. Yeah, that, yeah. that, that, that was, a, that was a, a, just a stupid... It's one of those moments where I just think, I'm just going to say something really stupid now. Uh, so that, yeah. But apart from that, all the other quotations at the start of the chapters are all real. And and what I've, I, as I'm sure you, you know, I, I wanted to incorporate genuine quotations from genuine activists so that people could see that what, what Titania is saying is not a million miles away from what the real people are saying. No, In fact, no. You know, I, I, I th- um, uh, one example I think I remember is the AOC quote. Yes. Um, and I, th- I think what she says is um, uh, people are more worried about me being, exa- or uh, people are more worried about being factually correct than about being morally right. She said that yeah. on Anderson Cooper, I think. That's right. Yeah. So I use that as a quotation for the, the chapter about the tyranny of facts. Yes. But, and, and, and other quotations like, like Munro Bergdorf saying that you can still be homeless and have white privilege. It's a real quotation. Um, the, the, the thing about, um, is it the Valerie Solanas one about to call a man is an animal is to flatter him. Yes. He's a, he's a walking dildo. These, so these things are not made up. Um, no, and but, you also quote Linda Sarsour when uh, Titania discusses what she calls internalized misogyny, which is yeah. women who don't believe in fourth wave feminism. Basically, and yes. uh, Linda Sarsour had said apparently ab- about writer Brigitte Gabrielle and activist Ayan Hirsi Ali that she would like to take their vaginas away. Yes, yeah, because she doesn't believe they, they should be called women. Um, I mean, she's not, obviously she's being metaphorical there. Uh, the point, though, is that she doesn't think that they are women because women, if they're real women, will share her exact identical political worldview. Exactly. I mean, what what a great, convenient get out. Anyone who disagrees with me must hate themselves. That's the only explanation. You know, it's a similar thing with the way that, that, that people pathologize disagreement now. 
So you, you disagree with same sex marriage. Well, that means you're homophobic. That means you're afraid. You have a disease. You have a condition. It means you are afraid of gay people. Maybe it's not that. Maybe they just don't agree with same sex marriage. And maybe you should have a discussion about it rather than just uh, diagnosing your opponent with a mental disorder. You absolute loon. You know, it's nuts. And then uh, or similarly, Islamophobia. Same thing. You know, people that gets you get you get all sorts of people conflated under that term from the bacon at mosques or the or the thugs who rip people's veils off in the streets and they get conflated with people like sam harris or douglas murray who raise legitimate criticisms of 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 what is an ideology a religious ideology those are not the same things douglas murray doesn't go around ripping veils off women in the street he's not a thug he's not an idiot right but both of those people then fall under the bracket of islamophobia because because what murray is saying is that he thinks there are there are uh, theological and philosophical problems within that that thought process within that ideology which is his right to say there should be absolutely no circumstances where any religion or political worldview should be ring fenced from from criticism and certainly not path- for when the people who do so when people express their right to criticize they are they are pathologized in this way it's it's yes. really gross you're obviously an islamophobe for saying this uh, right exactly must uh, be well you must be you're a white man uh, and also uh, that's how infantile this is that's what i mean this is not this is not serious adult discussion when people start throwing a- a- around those terms islamophobe homophobe racist nazi fascist they're infants they're children who've learned a whole bunch of words that they don't know the meaning of and it, uh, it it's not i i don't know how we resolve this because that seems to now become the norm it's even the norm in government It's even the norm amongst our politicians. We have people like David Lammy, who's a Labour MP, who just throws these insults. He said that Jacob Rees-Mogg and the European Research Group, who are a pro-Brexit group within government, he said that they were worse than Nazis. Not oh, even really? that they were Nazis, but that they were worse than Nazis. That's an elected MP saying that, right? That sounds like a child. Yeah. But it's and that's that's um that's a real problem. You know, we need we need we need the adults back in the room. Well, at least he didn't uh, threaten to have their vaginas taken away. And uh, what's the next step? You know, that's well. Also, <laughs> I, I I do believe that Ayan Hirsi Ali's vagina was already taken away. Well, well, there's there's that, isn't there? I think she, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. she was a FGM, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Titania Wright celebrates Sarsour actually when she was confronted uh, in a college auditorium about this statement that she would yeah. want to take their vaginas away. She said uh, that she didn't want to uh, answer because the question was posed by a white man. Another great get out, isn't it? So you don't, you know, you. Th- that's why. I see this as a cult because they are absolutely impervious to criticism or reason or debate. Yes. And do you want to know something interesting? I always. Linda Sarsour and AOC, Alexandra occasionally Cortez, as I call her, uh, uh, they are both part of the Justice Democrats. Right. Do you know of the Justice Democrats? No. No, they're a small group within the Democrats of America that come out of the American Socialist Society. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the same group as Momentum in Britain. I see. So they're they're a sort of further left segment of the of the Democrats. I suppose are they the ones related to the Squad, the Ilan Omar and and uh, you know the, there's the four four uh, yes precisely Democrats are known as the Squad, aren't they? Yes. It's uh, Presley and Omar and Ocasio Cortez, and there's um, one other Talib. Uh, Talib. That's right. And of course. They're not reflective of left wing or even Democrat thought in in America. They're the woke uh, wing of the Democrat. They want Party. a Green New Deal. Yes. Collective bargaining. Yeah. And a corporatist state. Right. But the thing is about that is that they will never win an election. Those people and those ideas will never be. It is absolute electoral poison. And this is why Donald Trump keeps going on about them. <laughs> it's pretty smart. Yeah. Because if, if if you think Democrat and you suddenly think Rashida Tlaib. You know, then, then you're not going to vote Democrat, and Democrats aren't going to vote Democrat. That's why Nancy Pelosi hates them. Yes, that's what. That's what you know. That it's not. It's identity politics and woke politics is not a popular form of politics. It's just. But a isn't power- this exactly what Jeremy Corbyn's Labour wants to do? They want yes. a Green New Deal. They want collective bargaining and a corporatist state. Not only that, uh, Corbyn's government wants much more severe press regulation. 
I mean, he's literally threatened the press. He said, if we get into power, you better watch out, you know. Um, he's bought into the woke movement. He got Monroe Bergdorf on board as an advisor. He, uh, and who's he, he, Monroe Bergdorf she's, for she's Swedes? She's LGBTQIA plus activist um, who is a, effectively, uh, you know, she, she, she was on television talking about how the white race are the most evil force of nature on Earth. So, you know, so she's a racist, basically. Um, but of course, because the work movement have redefined how it means uh, privilege, uh, pr prejudice plus power. OK, uh, which isn't a definition that anyone shares. It's just in their own little bubble. Um, so, the, the, you know, when, when, when Jeremy Corbyn appears uh, to give a speech and, and white people are charged £10 extra, well, then you know that he's buying into this woke culture. He's allowing that to happen. And and the problem with that is it's a minority. There's hardly any people are in support of this. They're really not. The problem is because it's such a bourgeois movement, the, the, they, they are in positions of power. They've infected everything. The law, uh, the media, arts, journalism, they, have, they are the decision makers, but there's not many of them. So when it comes to democracy, that's why they lose. That's why they were all so shocked when Trump won. But because they thought, because they only speak to each other, you know, yeah. uh, but, but, you know, they lost, they'll always lose. That's uh, why he's going to win. Do you it. think that because now uh, it's, it looks as if though Boris Johnson is challenging Jeremy Corbyn for a, a, re, uh, a snap election or what? It, what, yes. what do you... Which Corbyn won't agree to. So, so Corbyn has been going on for two years about how he must have another general election. When it comes to the crunch, if he knows he'll lose, he won't go for it. So it's strategic. Um, if, if Corbyn had any integrity, which I don't think he does anymore, um, he would go for that general election. Absolutely. In a heartbeat. But, but I he doesn't. He, no, I don't. I mean, I voted for Corbyn in the last election. I don't think he's, he's massively disappointed me. His stance on freedom of speech is appalling. His dishonesty about the EU is absolutely appalling. He's a, he's a Eurosceptic who has opposed the EU for 40 years. And now he's pretending that he, he, he supports it. Yeah. It's a How's that Brexit coming along, by the way? <laughs> Do you want me to just sort it in like well, two minutes? You know, you broke up with the rest of us like years ago and you still haven't moved out of the apartment. No, because we... Are you still paying rent? Uh, yeah, <laughs> we oh, are. Yeah, then we're fine. But <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But there's a lot of sexual tension now. Yeah. Them, you know, um, we voted to leave in 2016, three years on, and we haven't left. And the reason for that is we have a House of Commons, which is populated by people who don't care about democracy, basically. Uh, they care about their own careers and they, and they don't understand that the sovereignty of parliament comes from the people. They don't understand that. That, you know, that it's, it's, not, it's not serious politics. It's a joke. And, no, um, it, it's, it, it hurts me to see because I actually had some hope that you Brits would uh, have the values of freedom and individualism so ingrained in you that you would never actually accept this. I mean, I live in Sweden. Our state policy is Green New Deal, collective bargaining, corporatist state. We have all that. We've had everything you're fighting against for 80 years, and this country is going straight to hell. So the, the trouble is that we have, and our culture is becoming more and more infantilized, uh, which means that it, the more infantilized a culture becomes, the more likely our people are, are to be just directed, just told what to vote for and told what to think. That's, that's the unfortunate byproduct. That's why it's important to win the culture war. Because if you have an infantilized culture, then then people w will be content to have a parliament of elitists making decisions on their behalf. Because, of course, that children are content to have parents make decisions on their behalf. Uh, when you have a culture of people who think for themselves, a culture of adults, that doesn't happen anymore. And so that's really why we have to win the culture war. We have to we have to it's, it, it, everything rests on it. Everything does. Uh, I think the Brexit case is very, very good example. And, and, and actually, if we, you know, if we did go back to the polls now, I think Leave would win again. But that's why they'll do everything they can. That's why they don't want a general election. Corbyn knows full well if there's a general election and Boris Johnson runs on a, on a Brexit mandate, he, he'll get a landslide, particularly if he gets the support of the Brexit party. So do you think there are more people willing to vote for a Brexit now? Yeah. Particularly because I think a lot of people who voted Remain last time also are believers in democracy. And they see that what this is really about 
it's no longer about Brexit. That's over and done with. We had the arguments. We had months and months of the arguments. Everyone was engaged. Everyone knew what they were voting for, in spite of the, the people who will tell you otherwise. Um, everyone understood the principles. It was really actually quite exciting because for once, the whole country seemed to be really politically energised and, and we're talking about it. And it's so weird to subsequently be told that nobody knew what they were voting for. They certainly knew more about this than they'd known about any other election they've ever participated in in their lifetime. Um, because that's what happened, right? You voted to leave and yeah. you haven't left. And that sort of shows people that this is not a democratic institution. Which is why I think you're understand that a vote now for Brexit is actually a vote for democracy. It's got nothing to do with Brexit or the EU. It, it's it's a choice between whether we want to live in a democracy or we don't. Uh, at the moment, we don't. And I think this entire process has damaged democracy to the point that I don't think we can really claim to be living in a democracy anymore. So we need to we need to reinstate that. But that's why Brexit needs to happen, because it's not about the EU anymore. It's about it's about what sort of country we want to live in. And, you know, and the EU has form on this. I mean, this is what the EU is, an, is a, an anti-socialist movement, a neoliberal bloc that does not like democracy it has never liked democracy uh, so when they when they forced uh, when the when the greeks voted against the austerity measures and they just they don't care they just forced it through anyway same in ireland with the lisbon treaty same in the uh, denmark with the maastricht treaty they get the wrong vote they're going to go back and say no sorry you better yep. vote again or we'll, or we'll just ignore you that's what the eu does the eu is the complete antithesis to democratic principles um we need to get out well, uh, I wish you all the best. And <laughs> also, uh, we are all eating popcorn in front of our TV screens. Uh, it's, I, it's, I mean, it's like the parliament, is, it is quite interesting to watch them all absolutely tear each other apart and fall, fall to pieces. It is. And it's, it's really funny. There's, I mean, there's something essentially hilarious as well about it. There's something hilarious about all these people standing up, saying that, claiming that they're standing up for democracy whilst trying to destroy our democracy. It's really funny. Uh, undoubtedly. And you should know that in this country on state television, uh, we are told every night that Boris Johnson is evil. And I'm sure yeah. that democracy has been abolished. And uh, what, what is their justification for that? I wonder. In, why is he, why, why is he de abolishing democracy? Are they talking about because he prorogued parliament? Because he suspended parliament? Is that it? it? Yes. Did they did, were they similarly upset when John Major did this in 1997 because he wanted to avoid a scandal? No, uh, this is not. This is the problem with having an unwritten constitution is that people can play constitutional sleight of hand. I don't think it's a good idea to suspend Parliament as it happens. I don't think it is a very democratic route to take, but it is constitutionally valid. All right, but you do have a constitution. You just don't have one written down. Yeah, we have this thing floating in the air. That people can take little bits from and reinterpret and make up new rules. So do you uh, think you should get one? Yes, but the trouble is, who would write it? Uh, well, because you I, have a queen, don't you? She should write it, actually. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen her in all of Sasha Baron Cohen's films, and she seems lovely. Um, she, not only does she seem lovely, I think she'd do a really good job. I think she should write the Constitution. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, or me. I'll write it. <laughs> I'm just oh. saying, I, I was wondering, we don't really have a constitution here. We have uh, basic laws, uh, yeah. but they can also be changed sort of willy-nilly when they want to. Well, exactly. I mean, we, you know, we, we had a tradition here and, it, and it, to have an unwritten, uncodified constitution means you, you rely to an extent on the goodwill of the people, of the people in charge, not to, not to mess with the rules, not to, you know, but we've got a speaker in the House of Commons who just changes it changes those openly breaches the rules of parliament when it suits his political agenda you know it's nuts and, and uh, there's no way for you to hold them responsible except for the general elections right and that's why they don't want one all right that's it basically but you have to have one uh, a certain number of years in between right so yeah yeah we'll we'll have we will have another one um but that just not at the moment not like not until corbyn can be sure he'll win it all right and do you think that will ever happen actually no why because too many labor supporters are want us out of the eu uh the majority of labor seats were won by leave voters the majority of swing seats depend on leave voters um the industrial heartlands of the north are overwhelmingly leave voting as soon as Corbyn, as he will do in his next manifesto, puts forward the idea of a second vote 
or that he will campaign to remain in the EU, which he will. He will lose millions of voters voting support and they will flock to the Brexit party or the Tories. All right. That is that must feel a bit strange for you. Why? Well, well, I, well, you know Brendan, right? I do know Brendan, yeah. Yeah, and at heart you were Labour, weren't you? Uh, socialist. No, I voted, yeah, but I don't think that Labour is a socialist party. That's my, the, that's my opinion. Neither I, are the Tories, right? No, there is no socialist party. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations then. You've achieved what I hope to achieve in this country. <laughs> we should talk more about that one day. About your uh, views on socialism. Uh, I hope skeptics. we will. And I'd like to, if I come to London, I'd like to come by your stand-up club and see if I can swing it in English. Yeah, that would be amazing. You should definitely do that. I have I'd some love you to... really good paedophilia jokes. Uh, okay, well, that's all we do. It's a paedophilia joke night. That's all well, it is. So come along and do that. Uh, that'd be great. So just a few last questions about Titania. Yeah. Because Titania mm -hmm. makes a great point, for instance, that uh, ISIS cannot at least be Islamophobic. She's a grand, great friend of people of color, which she yes. punches together into one single coherent group. Yeah, they're all the same according to the social justice. But that's why you get people of color and whites, basically. So yes. it's, it's basically white people and everyone else. But I, I, uh, I was confused because there's no chapter on uh, uh, Jews. Is there not? No, there is. she mentions, I mean, she mentions uh, Jewish people when she's talking about Labour, when she's talking about the anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Did she? Yeah. I should have made a note about that. She says about how, um, ah, yeah, I can find it for you <laughs> if you want. Yes, I, that would be great because I, I've, I've made uh, quite a lot of uh, notes in your book. Yeah. Um, and, and congratulations as well to the greatest rape joke ever written. Oh, what's that? Uh, the one about that male babies, the first thing a male does is rape his mother because he's inside her without her consent. Yeah, I think she would believe that. I think well, so. <laughs> yes, but it's also, as I said, the greatest rape joke I've actually ever read, I think. Well, thank you. <laughs> and I am an aficionado. I'm sure. <laughs> and of course, by joking about rape, that makes me pro-rape, apparently, uh, according to some people. But of course, people are very simplistic, aren't they? Here we go. Uh, he, she's talking about how Corbyn has been dogged by accusations that his party is anti-Semitic. And she says, I don't believe it. She says, I've always loved Jews. I admire their wit, their financial <laughs> acumen and their cunning. Yes. And I have no doubt that Corbyn feels the same way. And she says, there's no place for anti-Semitism in my life. I'm quite partial to the occasional bagel. I enjoy the songs of Barbara Streisand. I've even read that silly Anne Frank novel about a girl who gets stuck in a cupboard. Yes, I remember so now. She, Thank you. So she addresses it. She addresses the issue. I mean, you know, uh, often with Tanya McGrath, I think it's, it's, you know, it's her inadvertently revealing her own prejudices. I think that comes across quite a lot. No, uh, without a doubt. And, um, and she's also afraid of Brexit. I noticed just oh. the other day she wanted to abolish... Uh, the the right to vote uh, for Brexit, right? Yeah, she she thinks the only way you sustain democracy is if you force people by law to vote a certain way. That's her view of it, yeah. Which actually, again, sounds absurd on the face of it. It's not a million miles away from what, what the people in charge are saying, really. You know, you, you voted the wrong way, but in order to save democracy, we're going to ignore that vote. That's effectively what they're saying. So all the people who say to me that, that she's not like that it's a straw man, you know, that I'm, I'm presenting arguments that don't exist. They're certainly exaggerated and hyperbolized, but they do exist. And no, they not exist, they're pretty, pretty mainstream. I think you're right. And also, I come from a country that's, you know, been going through gender mainstreaming now since the early 90s. So right. uh, uh, we're really seeing the effects, uh, I can tell you. I mean, boys in school are doing worse than ever. Right, okay. Here. And also we have uh, quite a few children transitioning. In the last four years, I think it's a uh, 100% more uh, young people under the age of 16 transitioning than ever before. Well, this is what happens when you, when you advance a very conservative view of gender, which is that boys should behave in one way and girls should behave in another. This is what we used to try and fight against. This is what the second wave feminists spent years trying to break down. But unfortunately now the, uh, the current 
uh, uh, gender identity movement wants to reinstate gender norms and say that, well, if a girl behaves like a tomboy, if a girl is, is, is pay, wants to play football or has masculine tastes, maybe they should consider transitioning. In other words, let's fix them. Yes. Let's make them more like a proper proper boy or a proper girl, you know. There's nothing wrong with a boy behaving in a traditionally feminine way or having feminine tastes. doesn't make him not a boy. No, no, I, I'm quite sure you're right. Although Titania says that if a baby cries, it probably wants to transition. It means yes, yes. it wants to transition. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Or it's Pro complaining about, you know, lactose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, I mean, she, she, she believes that anyone, any male who hasn't transitioned is, is effectively a misogynist. Because if you're a misogynist, why wouldn't you want to be a woman? That is a, so, a good point. So, uh, because you, the, you end the book with uh, an entire chapter on comedy. Yes. Why is comedy so dangerous? It, because she would she perceives comedy to be uh, a means by which hate speech can be normalized and legitimized. So in other words, you can say something, you can spread fascism and then just say, ah, oh, but it was only a joke. And this is this is the argument of the social justice movement. There was an article in The Guardian the other day when The Guardian is the bastion of the social justice activism. It's not serious journalism anymore. Um, they, they wrote an article about how... Um, Basically, to cut it a long story short, speech that we disagree with should be called hate speech. And therefore, it's not uh, anti-free speech to clamp down on hate speech. So that's effectively what they're saying. Um, and what do you, Andrew Doyle, believe? Uh, why do you believe comedy is so dangerous? I don't believe it is. <laughs> no. You wrote no. a book uh, as Titania McGrath, ridiculing yeah, she... uh, the social justice movement. Yeah. Uh, so you must in some way agree with them that comedy can have an effect. Yeah, I, I do agree that comedy can have an, an effect, but I don't believe it is dangerous to make jokes about. So I don't think it's, there is a danger to that. I but think there's a liberal... but, but don't they have a point? It's dangerous to them. Oh, yeah, from their perspective, they, that, because they, they think, well, it's based on a misunderstanding of comedy, isn't it? They, they think if you joke about rape, or you joke about racism, or you joke about homophobia, you're endorsing those things. Yes. That's how literal-minded they are. Um, now, someone who, who thinks that isn't really in a position to make any judgment about comedy full stop, because they just fundamentally don't understand it. Um, that's why they think it's dangerous, because they're not thinking for themselves. They're, they've been failed by education. They've been, they don't have that, that faculty to think, to think freely. I read a critique of Woke in The New Statesman, I think. <laughs> yeah. Have you read it? Yeah, it was, I, mean, I got loads of messages after it saying, did you write this? Because it, it, felt, <laughs> it felt like something that Titania would write. It did, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was because she attacked you for your privilege, your whiteness, your age. Yeah, Usual. yeah isn't that weird? There's a weird kind of, for people who are very kind of... Um, all about social justice and equality. They don't mind being ageist, do they? That, no. that, that sort of blind spot. We had that with the Brexit vote, like all elderly people, they shouldn't be allowed to vote. You know, uh, it, they have their hypocrisies, don't they? They do. Um, but also, but, them all into that trap. But it's she great. ended it with a brilliant idea. And what was the idea? The idea was, I wonder how funny uh, Andrew and the likes of him would think it was if I started a Twitter account that was a, a middle-aged white man who just enjoyed himself and made misogynistic, Islamophobic, homophobic or racist jokes all the time. Yeah, well, she should do it, shouldn't she? And, well, uh, I thought that's just describing most comedians. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And they like, already exist. You just want to outlaw them. And the problem with doing that, of course, is you wouldn't be satirizing me because that's not what I am. Uh, so you'd be satirizing someone, a product of your own imagination. So by all means, go and do that. You know, I mean, she lacked the basic understanding. I mean, she she made the, the, the mistake of thinking that what I'm doing is, is making fun of minority groups. I mean, imagine having that. If your if your understanding is so simplistic, if you if that's where you're coming from, you can't really be taken seriously as a, a critic of comedy, can you? I mean, that's it's so ba it's such a basic misunderstanding that you can't go any you can't go any further than that. It, no, it's, no. Fun. it's great though. It's great. They fall into their own trap. You know, no, I've been I've been quoting that review on my posters. It's it's just particularly from a, a woke publication like the New Statesman. It's 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 a gift because yeah. what they do is prove the reason why I need why I do what I do. They just demonstrate it all over again. 
And you did it wonderfully, I must say. And thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, no, thank you. Uh, we don't... Uh, we don't really have a comedic tradition for for writing books anymore in Sweden. All right, okay. Uh, it's uh, been out of fashion uh, since circa 1946 for okay. some reason. <laughs> That's a shame. <laughs> they used to write a lot of comedy, but since it was all anti-Semitic, it's uh, gone now. <laughs> right, okay. okay. <laughs> well, so, I didn't know this about your country. I didn't know. No, I, I think most Swedes today don't know. No. They don't know what they did during the Second World War. For instance. Really? No. That, have, they have no idea. They were neutral. Okay. Well, that's a problem. I think, I think uh, education about your own past is important. We've covered this, haven't we? But yes, I think that is important. Yes, we have covered it. And I want to thank you for uh, joining me today. Uh, no, thank you. It's fun. Yes. It's been nice. And, and I hope uh, to talk to you again, uh, if not in person, then on Skype, because I want to yes. check in from time to time and see how you're doing. Do so, yes, absolutely. Do you come to London often? Well, uh, it won't be as much in the future because our currency is currently, uh, well, going down the drain. So it's become very expensive. Last time was this spring when I interviewed Brendan O'Neill and I could only afford to be there for 24 hours. Otherwise, I would have gone bankrupt. So, okay. so <laughs> That is the problem. Yeah. Well, maybe Skype, maybe Skype it is then. <laughs> Maybe, but uh, I uh, I would really like to try and and do stand up in English in London, because I haven't. No, well, come I, I've done the Fringe, come, I, and I've done the Brighton Fringe, but I haven't been yeah. to London. So, yeah. So you haven't. Well, come to London when, uh, whenever you like. Send me a message. We'll sort it out. We're the second Tuesday of every month. So if you've got a date that works for you, that's the second Tuesday of any month, then there's a spot for you. And Thank I'd love you. To see, I'd love to see you do it. That'd be great. Yes, uh, and it's uh, it's woke comedy you do, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just purely woke. Exactly. We're yes. very militant about it, and we 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 ensure that the audience dis think and decide whether a joke has crossed any lines before they laugh. All right. So, you, so after every joke, you get this moment of assessment where people are looking at each other, trying to assess: is it okay to laugh at that? Will that be normalizing hate speech? And then you get a sense of, okay, it's, it's, it's all right. Sometimes I'll signal to them, no, that's an acceptable joke to laugh You're at. being sarcastic, but you're describing every audience in Sweden. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for participating, Andrew. And uh, I wish you all the best. And I recommend everyone to read Titania's book, Woke. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Deconstructive Criticism with today's guest Andrew Doyle and also the fierce and fearless Titania McGrath. If you want to find her or buy her and Andrew's book, you can find the links to their social media and the book at www.aronflam.com. Thank you for contributing to Deconstructive Criticism. Thank you for being a Patreon, donating via PayPal, Bitcoin or Swish. 0768-943737. Thank you if you are a supporter of Deconstructive Criticism. And a very, very special thanks uh, aimed at you who bought my book Det här är en svensk tiger, uh, which in English means this is a Swedish tiger. It does not exist in English yet, but I'm working on finding a translator and hopefully I can get it done by Christmas. But that is dependent on you buying enough copies of the Swedish original and by now uh, you that ordered a copy should have it in your hand. It is a riveting read. I should know I wrote it. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to write this book. It has been one of the most grueling, hellish experiences of my life and the most rewarding uh, if not monetarily, then at least artistically. This is a Swedish tiger, traces the trouble Sweden is in today to what it did during the Second World War, via Olaf Palme's meeting with Yasser Arafat in Algier in 1974, and back to the present and the fall of the greatest social democracy the world has ever seen, Sweden. If you haven't yet ordered your copy, you can still do that at www.aronflam.com slash merchandise. I am Aron Flam, and until you hear from me again, have a good unit of time.